Good afternoon and a very welcome to this web clinic. Or good morning if you're in Australia and New Zealand and good evening if you are in the US or Canada. Um, it's lovely to have a big crowd and um, we Kaori Kids is committed to provide the information and strategies to help as many children as possible. Make sure that your speakers or headphones are on and are, are connected um, to your computer and that your computer's volume is turned up. You do not need a microphone. Everyone except me are muted. We'll email a link to the recording of this web clinic within the next week. And also we'll have to send you the slides, the, the printout of the slides because there is a problem here on the um, GoToWebinar and we cannot add it at this time so you cannot print it. But make your notes, all the slides are numbered so you can at a later time um, connect your notes with the slides. Um, use the menu on the right of your screen which looks like this. You can check your sound in the box as indicated. Post your questions in the box marked questions. Please do not use the chat box as I shall not be looking at the questions before the end. The slides are available for you to download as I said at a, at a later time we'll just have to send the email to you. We are quite a large crowd which is very exciting and I hope this web clinic will give you insight in tactile defensiveness to help you and the children in your life. I am Marga Gray, a pediatric occupational therapist. I have been an OT forever um, and I have, been, I have a very keen interest in sensory integration and the sensory processing. Um, I'm also a mother of three adult children and four gorgeous grandchildren. My latest focus is Kaori Kids as I want to help as many children as possible and online programs are the easiest effective way to reach many children. Kaori Kids is committed to provide information and strategies to help as many children as possible. We rely on many years experience and on the latest research to ensure that the information we provide our programs and our advice are the best and the most relevant to help your child and or the children in your care. This web clinic is one in a series of short web clinics on sensory modulation presented by Kaori Kids. The previous one was on movement seeking. The umbrella term sensory processing disorder or SPD was explained in another web clinic. You are most welcome to contact us to receive a recording of these web clinics and to ensure that you understand where tactile defensiveness fits in under this umbrella. SPD is a condition in which the brain has trouble receiving and processing information from the senses. The modulation of the sensations is one of the pillars of SPD. Sensory modulation disorder leaves many children with symptoms of anxiety, with concentration issues and with poor coping skills for social and school environments. Parents are often in despair as they find it difficult to understand their child and to cope with the child's issues. Now sensory modulation is a neurological function and is the organization of sensory information for ongoing use. One of the behaviors that we observe in children with a sensory modulation disorder is the avoidance of some touch experiences. These children are often referred for occupational therapy or other interventions as they tend to avoid grooming such as teeth brushing. They might find nail clipping uncomfortable or even painful. They are sensitive to textures in clothes and often want tags removed from clothes. They dislike hair brushing and hair washing. They might avoid touch by family, but then at other times they might seek cuddles from specific people. Now these behaviors are usually not the child's chosen behaviors. The children want to do the right thing. They want to please the adults in their lives, but their personal reactions to the sensory experiences in the environment prevent them from doing so. Today we are going to discuss a little girl nicknamed Snog. A synonym for Snog is Cuddle. 
I found it quite challenging to come up with an appropriate nickname for a person suffering from tactile defensiveness. The reason being that tactile defensiveness presents in many different ways with many different reactions and symptoms. We are going to discuss tactile defensiveness and provide a definition for this term. We shall also provide information on the differences between SNOG and others. Many people who have traits of tactile defensiveness are more sensitive and emotional than others. SNOG is also a bit unpredictable regarding to her responses to everyday situations. Situations that the rest of us don't even notice or just find normal are challenging for her. Then we will also discuss the various options to help SNOG. But first I want to briefly give you some background of sensory processing disorder for those who haven't had the opportunity to listen to the first webinars. As I said before, tactile defensiveness is part of sensory processing disorder and it is quite common amongst the SPD population. They usually have problems with some other aspects of SPD as well. Thus it is important to see tactile defensiveness as part of the bigger concept of SPD. SPD, as you know by now, stands for Sensory Processing Disorder. We have discussed this condition in detail in the first web clinic in this series. And you're welcome to ask me to send a recording. I'm going to recap on SPD very quickly. The process by which sensory information is sent to the brain and the messages um, and the brain has to process this. It sends messages back to the body and this is called sensory processing. If there is something wrong with this process, we call it sensory processing disorder. The nosology of SPD was compiled by Miller and other, others and I have used it in the first web clinic to explain SPD. The present series of web clinics <clears throat> are the modulation disorders over here. Um, and the first one was a, a web clinic on the movement modulation um, and that was called We Met Zig Zaggy and he was a very active and movement seeking boy. So today you'll meet Snog. In the previous web clinic we have covered the sensory thresholds. Now Snog has a low threshold for touch experiences and she presents with high alertness levels. She is oversensitive in some situations, tend to be anxious and easily overwhelmed and also react with defensive behavior at times. Snog tends to often be in the fight or fright mode. This can present with shallow breathing, sweaty hands, poor concentration and difficulty to interact appropriately with others at times. She often avoids situations and prefers to play on her own. However, when with her mother she is dependent on her mother's support and can be clingy in unfamiliar situations. Snog presents with a low threshold with most activities. These might include a slight fear of unpredictable movement and heights. She is also sensitive to textures in food and can be anxious in noisy environments. Snog presents with a high threshold for deep pressure on her skin. She just cannot get enough of the wrestling game with that and always pulls the bean bags on top of her when she watches TV. Snog can be deeply involved in some activities such as watching TV or playing with Lego. During these times she seems to be in her own world with poor attention to the area around her. In general, sensory modulation disorders fluctuate from day to day and even from hour to hour. Snog might be enjoying Dad's wrestling game up to a point and then suddenly burst into tears and be very anxious. Snog also behaves quite differently at home and at school. It seems as if she can keep herself together at school, but then when at home she displays tantrums, meltdowns and anxiety. The word snog means cuddle. 
Snog has difficulty with the processing of the touch sensations. Touch sensations are complex as it is the umbrella term for many different sensations related to touch. Touch sensations are registered through receptors in the various layers of your skin. Receptors differ according to the sensation that they register. The accuracy and intensity of a touch sensation depends on the receptor and on the number of receptors in a specific area. For example, there are many receptors in the fingertips and around the mouth, but much less on the back. Thus, we use our fingers to identify small objects and different textures, and not our backs. Touch sensations include the sensation of light touch on the skin, such as the feeling of loose-fitting clothes, someone touching you gently, or the feeling of an insect or ant walking on your skin. Touch sensations also include the sensation of deep pressure on the skin, such as when someone puts a heavy hand on your shoulders, the weight of a heavy blanket, the pressure from tight-fitting clothing, and also when you bump into furniture or other objects. Also, when you lean into another person. Touch sensations include the movement of hair on the skin, such as when you brush or comb your hair, or when clothes move the hair on your arm or leg. Pain is part of the sensations registered by receptors in your skin. I think we all know what pain sensations are. Examples are burns, sharp ob objects such as needles, pinching, pulling of hair, and many more. Another sensation registered by the skin is temperature. Temperature provides information about the environment regarding cold and heat. It tells us to move away from a hot fire or to put a warm Put, or to put warm clothes on in a cold wind. Form and shape recognition is the ability to recognize a shape held in the hand or anywhere on the skin. These sensations are all registered with receptors in the skin. We often do not think about it, but we certainly react to it in various ways. Think about a pain sensation or the feeling of someone stroking your hair without warning. Also, when an insect or a huge spider, like the one in the picture, walks over your foot or hand. We clearly register the sensation and it is often accompanied by strong emotional reactions. I think you can all clearly see that the modulation of touch sensations are not simple, it is a complex process with many different reactions and behaviours related to a number of different sensations under the umbrella of touch. It's also an extremely interesting sense to work with. The sensations registered by the receptors in the skin are sent via sensory pathways to the brain. On the way to the brain, these sensations travels through many different areas in the brain. The majority ends in the sensory cortex of the brain to be processed. However, many other areas in the brain affect the reaction to these sensations, depending on the areas where impulses are sent to. One of the most important connections with the sensory area where touch is registered is the connections to the limbic system where emotions are registered. We all have specific reactions when we are distressed or emotional. Most people either need a tight hug and the physical support from others, or they would not want to be touched and would rather say something like, don't touch me. Keep in mind that most sensations are registered in the more than one area of the brain. And these different areas communicate with each other during the processing of sensations to produce a reaction or a behavior. Certainly not something simple. Now let us have a look at SNOG and her tactile defensiveness.
The definition of tactile defensiveness, as provided by the website centuryprocessingdisorder.com, is as follows. Children who have tactile defensiveness are sensitive to touch and can be easily overwhelmed by and fearful of ordinary daily experiences and activities. What does SNOB do? At this point, I can inform you that SNOB is a real goal and presented with the issues as I'll indicate shortly. Of course, her name is not SNOG, but I have seen many boys and girls with similar issues. SNOG avoids activities such as finger paint or making patterns with shaving foam. At home, she prefers to bath. She is overwhelmed with negative reactions after a shower. Snog refuses to wear some clothes and tends to wear the same old clothes over and over. She is often distressed when her favorite clothes are in the wash. She also takes a long time in the morning to put her school uniform on and can actually be in so much distress about it that she cries or has a meltdown. Her mum actually took a video to show me her reactions. And I can promise you, it will make you as sad as I was. Snog took up to one and a half hours to get dressed in her school uniform. When she was a toddler, she used to scream when her hands were dirty. Now, sensory defensiveness can prevent a child from play and interactions critical to learning and social interactions. Snog prefers to play alone and will move away from group activities. She often doesn't participate in arts and crafts, and if she's forced to, she ends up looking anxious and tired. She doesn't sit close to peers during story time, and she avoids play outside when other children touch her or bump into her. These games often end with snog in tears or looking fearful. Other children with tactile defensiveness might react with aggressive and defensive reactions. Often, children with tactile defensiveness has a hypersensitivity to touch input and will avoid touching, becoming fearful of, or bothered by ordinary touch experiences. Snog often doesn't participate in arts and crafts and she yeah, swimming can be quite stressful with Snog, being very anxious upon arrival. But then she loves being in the water, and it's difficult to persuade her to get dressed after the lesson. So how can we help this child? First of all, we have to understand her condition. We have to understand what is tactile defensiveness and we have to try and imagine how it feels to be inside her little body. If the adults in Snog's life understand her condition and truly understand the tactile defensiveness, she will, need, she will receive support and the support that she needs. Secondly, we have to incorporate some calming strategies. I'm sorry, this was a mistake. Let me just get back. Okay, we have to um, incorporate some calming strategies to reduce anxiety levels. We'll discuss activities and strategies that you can use. Thirdly, there are some environmental modifications that are effective in helping the tactile defensive person. And last, I'll give you some therapy interventions that will be helpful to support SNOG. Okay, now it's time for the next slide. So, let us see how can we understand tactile defensiveness. Snog has low thresholds for touch experiences. She might feel someone accidentally brushing against her on the playground when others are not even aware of it. It is as if she is feeling better than others. She is aware of touch experiences when others would not notice or not be bothered by it. Our brain perceives the messages from the skin as very important for our survival. It is, after all, the first direct contact that our bodies have with the environment. Thus, when we touch unexpectedly, we can have a load, load of emotional reactions. 
much more so than when we unexpectedly hear a sound. So snog move into the fight or flight mode with dilated pupils, increased heartbeat, sweaty hands and faster breathing. These reactions are from the autonomic nervous system and cannot be controlled. It would not help to tell Snog to stop her hands from sweating or to lower her heart rate. She reacts like someone in a dangerous situation when she experiences some touch sensations. Increased anxiety and emotional reactions create problems with concentration to the task at hand. To be in this anxious state makes it difficult to concentrate and to stay on task. Think of yourself when you are nervous about an important meeting or in distress because you heard bad news. When you are anxious, it is very difficult to concentrate on tasks such as to follow a conversation, to figure out how much to pay at the cash register or to solve a simple problem. Light touch for example, the movement of a feather on your skin is usually excitatory and can create more feelings of being overwhelmed and anxious. Whereas deep pressure, such as the pressure of a tight hug, a weighted blanket or a heavy hand on the shoulder, is usually calming. This is one of the reasons why Snog finds it difficult to stand in lines where there is continual accidental touching by others standing close to her. She might be better off when standing at the beginning, at the beginning or the end of the line. She might also prefer to sit at a single desk as sharing a desk creates many opportunities to light touch. The most difficult part to understand is that these symptoms can fluctuate from day to day. It can be associated to things that we can understand such as busy day, tiredness, lack of sleep or many different textures to handle. But at times we will find it hard to associate the fluctuation with anything that we can observe. However, we'll have to trust that SNOG has a reason for being overly sensitive on a specific day and less on another. We are not in her body and we cannot judge. It can be difficult to follow the fine line between prompting and accepting her avoidance or between discipline with consequences and leaving her to avoid some situations. Snog often exhibits exaggerated emotional reactions which are too intense for the situation. Snow can easily be in tears but can also lash out unexpectedly followed by feelings of regret or feelings of worthlessness afterwards. Of course social skills are impacted by her tendency to overreact and to be emotional in situations that others find pleasant. Snog is fearful amongst many children or even in small groups of unfamiliar children. Snog also lacks an accurate body awareness or interception. She sometimes wets the bed, goes for periods of time when her fluid intake is too low and often wakes up during the night. She can be grumpy when she wakes up in the morning. Snog has experienced trauma very early in life. It was nothing major and the mother could hardly remember about her difficulty and long birth, about the fact that Snog had to be in an incubator for two days after birth with little contact with her mother. However, these relatively minor events can have a relatively minor effect on sensory processing and specifically on the processing of the touch sensations. Many years ago I noticed a strong link between tactile defensiveness and separation from the mother directly after birth. I saw this so many times that I believed there is a strong connection. Now fortunately others have done the research and it is proven that tactile defensiveness is related to trauma around birth. 
I've also seen extreme cases of tactile defensiveness in children who underwent medical procedures during the toddler years. Other traumatic events can also lower a child's threshold for sensory experiences. And this child can develop tactile defensiveness and or other sensory processing problems. However, there are times that we cannot pinpoint any event or incident that could cause sensory processing problems. The last thing I want is that parents feel guilty about anything that happened in the early months or years. I strongly believe that all parents do the best they can do with the knowledge, energy and resources they have available at any given time. Many parents report that they had difficulty with the child in the baby years. This varies from child to child but can include a dislike of being held, literally pushing the parent away, in general an unsettled baby, and there can be feeding issues, latching issues, and then just extreme reactions when being dressed. Let us look at strategies to use to help Snog to stay in a calm state with effective self-regulation. The first thing is to avoid light touch experiences. We have talked about this before. These can be loose fitting clothes, someone gently stroking hair without warning and many others. We use light touch in therapy to desensitize snog skin for light touch, but we also always follow it up with deep pressure on the skin to avoid the fight or fright reaction. Examples that can be used at home and in the classroom are to physically provide deep pressure with a rolling pin. I have used paint rollers or pressure with my hands on the shoulders and back. Weighted objects such as a weighted blanket or lap pad are often effective. Tight fitting clothes to wear under loose fitting clothes can be very comfortable. Snog loves these and wear it every day. There are many websites selling these clothes. I'm thinking of comfort clothes for kids and jet proof clothing, but I'm sure Google will, help fill, will be helpful in finding suppliers where you are in the world. Weighted jackets are popular with many children. This bean bag is fairly new on the market and looks very comfortable. However, you do not need to buy expensive objects. Use weighted wheat bags, heavy blankets and pillows, a stack of towels, things that you have in your house. You can also massage your child. Make sure you use deep pressure and follow the child's lead of what is comfortable and what not. To wrap your child in a blanket in a tight roll is one of my favorite activities for the tactile defensive child. I have yet to meet a child who doesn't like this. Once again, you do not have to buy anything special. To me, one of the best and most effective strategies to provide deep pressure is physical contact from the parent. Many parents report that the child will run away from touch, but then seeks tight hugs at other times. Don't be disheartened. Provide tight hugs when the child needs it. You can also use deep breathing and yoga positions at regular times throughout the day or as part of your child's sensory diet to help your child to stay in a calm state with effective self-regulation. So this is one of the slides that I use with Ziggy as well, but this will also help with snog. Slow rhythmical linear movements are always calming. This is after all how we naturally, this is, sorry, this is after all how we naturally rock a baby forward and backwards from the head to the toes and it's always calming and settling. Snog loves to roll over an exercise ball. She was scared and anxious of this movement initially, but soon enjoyed the slow rhythmical experience and presented with improved self-regulation after about five minutes of these movements. Controlled jumping 
on a slow beat or slow big jumps from one tile to the other for, is also calming. In therapy sessions, we often make use of suspended equipment such as hammocks. Of course, the movements have to be controlled and the child should be involved in an activity and should have a goal to ensure that the movement is functional. Okay, so environmental modifications. Avoid light touch. Do anything you can to avoid that light touch. Be aware that other kids can provide that accidentally. Don't share a desk. Let the child stand at the beginning or the end of a line. Sit at the edge of a group and not in the middle of a group. And it's a good idea to have a little carpet tile or a little square where they can sit on. Um, it gives them their position, this is their spot where they can sit on and it uh, automatically encourages the other kids just to move a little bit away from this child on the tile. Um, then also avoid loose fitting clothes. That's the reason why Snog didn't want to put a school uniform on. Once she had the pressure and the tight fitting clothing to wear under her school garments, it was much easier for her to handle. Then also, if you have to lie touch like a shower, um, dressing, undressing, always follow that up with deep pressure, um, even if it's only a tight cuddle or a tight hug. Then you can use deep pressure and proprioception. So weighted objects are also lovely and always calming. So they can use it, you can put it on top of the body like this lap pad here, or they can um, carry a, a weighted um, backpack. Um, then log rolling or rolling up in a blanket as I have um, um, indicated before, pushing and pulling heavy things, hand pushes, push-ups, even push-ups in the sitting position is great, um, and fidget toys are all, th it's not directly related to touch, but definitely has a calming in effect on children. Okay, so therapy and other interventions. So first of all, um, Sensory integration th occupational therapy is very important. Um, an assessment will be good um, to give the therapist some background. Um, individual therapy using tactile desensitizing techniques. There are various techniques, um, amongst others the Wilbarger protocol, which I find extremely effective. Um, and then we have a lot of these activities incorporated in the Coordi Child program. Um, then Self-regulation groups are very effective, but only when defensive reactions are reduced. It wouldn't help to put this um, child with defensive reactions and a lot of anxiety because of touch experiences in a group where she might just experience more touch. So be mindful of what, which groups you, in, you put your child in um, and make sure that your child is ready to handle the group situation. Okay, then the sensory diet is also always a good idea, as I said in the previous web clinic as well. Um, it's a carefully designed, personalized activity plan that provides the sensory input a person needs to stay focused and organized throughout the day. So um, a sensory diet will not only um, focus on one sense, um, but if the touch, sense of touch is the most important one at that stage and your therapist will help you to ad identify which one is the most important and the, um, yeah, the, the one that will be best to address first. You start with that and you, you build up on that sensory diet. Um, you have to experiment with different options. Um, I usually start with one sense and build it up. It might be the you know if the child is really sensory or tactile defensive, um, I might need to start with another sense. Um, so I might start with movement or I might even start with music, um, and then later on when the sensory system is a little bit more organised, we can then address the very sensitive touch sense. But it depends on the child. Um, so sensory diets are presented at regular intervals during the day according to the child's need and the Coordi Child Program is a lovely one to use. Um, you use that once or twice a day, um, 15 to 20 minutes um, and you have lovely touch and movement experiences. 
<clears throat> then um, just here, that's more or less the end of that um, web clinic and um, just the future web clinics will be more in the series on sensory modulation so the next one will be in September on Dozy who avoids movement and is very scared of movement then in October we'll have the chewers and picky eaters such as chomp and champ and then in November we'll have dyspraxia and that might be um, in two sessions we'll see how it goes Okay, the next one is just questions and answers that have been sent in before this web clinic. So I just want to answer them and then I'll answer your questions that you've asked now. So Melissa um, asks, why is it challenging to put a school uniform on? Oh, Melissa, I, I hope I have answered the question up to now. Uh, a school uniform is usually loose fitting um, and it's usually quite, um, you know, if they don't use a little golf shirt, the other uniforms are usually a, a quite um, um, a cotton, a stiff fabric, so it doesn't fit around the skin. It, it's loose fitting and it's, it touches the skin all the time. And, and that can be really stressful for a tactile defensive child. So if you don't want to spend time on the um, calming clothes um, or money on the calming clothes, you can actually just you know, put a t-shirt of a size too small on and um, even panties, tight-fitting panties can help them and that gives that deep pressure throughout the day and that helps them to um, self-regulate. I hope that answers that question. And then Ben asks, um, can adults have this condition? And I want to say yes, yes, yes. And I have seen many adults and um, as I said, it fluctuates. It's very different from one person to the other. The, the advantage that adults have is that they can make choices. So they can actually move, remove themselves from situations. They can um, choose not to be in a group. They can choose not to go, not to participate in specific sport, contact sport, for instance. Whereas a child often don't have those choices and they just have to go to assembly and they have to sit in the middle of a hundred other kids um, and they have to stand in line. Um, so we see these issues more clearly in children and of course they don't have the self-regulation to just keep themselves together. Um, whereas an adult can for a short period of time and then move out of it. But it can create a lot of problems in adults, um, including sexual, including um, relationships with other people and emotional problems. So yes, and we can help adults as much as we can help children. It's just that adults are usually not identified um, because 20 to 30 years ago, nobody knew of this, um, synd um, this disorder. Um, okay, Gloria, how can I make grooming activities easier for my child? Oh, this is a tricky one because it's something that you cannot avoid. You have to brush that child's teeth, the hair has to be brushed, the hair has to be washed. So just to make it easier, um, just remove as many other sensations as possible. So don't use the shower with loud noise, um, with, uh, with other children in the room, um, with lots of activity in the room. It make lower the lights, use a bath instead of a shower, um, take the clothes off before the bath and then give tight cuddles and tight hugs, wrap up in a tight in a big blanket and hold the or in a big towel, put them in the bath, wash with fairly deep pressure on the skin and not light touch. Avoid um, a bubble bath for instance. We use bubble bath to desensitize, but then you have to follow it up with a deep pressure, like wrapping them up in a towel. So um, if you want to desensitize, use light touch, but always follow it up with a deep pressure activity. Okay, and then Jessica asks, will my child always have this condition or can she be healed? Or I've seen so many kids, Jessica, who just after a few weeks, the parents just come back and say, wow, she's trying new foods. She's, um, she didn't put her old clothes on. She actually put on a dress for, oh, that's one thing that the 
girls often doesn't want to wear dresses because of course a dress is loose fitting and you have the seam of the dress always bumping into your legs and it's light touch, light touch all the time. So um, yes, they, it's, they come back fairly quickly, especially if you use the Will Barger protocol correctly um, or if you do many other desensitizing activities and follow that up with deep pressure. Um, yes, that can definitely be, I, I don't want to say healed because it's not an illness, but it can definitely improve a lot and in quite a, f a fairly short period of time. Um, and Sandra, how can we make haircuts easier? That is a big problem. Um, you get hairdressers that specialize in special needs kids and they come to your house and they know all the tricks to help. Um, but in general, wrap the child up in a towel or a blanket, give them lots of deep pressure before you go for the head cut, um, give them a head massage, a really deep, heavy, deep pressure massage before they have to um, experience a light touch of the cut. Avoid clippers because that's an extra noise and the extra sensation. Um, you can actually put the child in front of a mirror so that they can be warned of the hands and the scissors coming to the head and it's not um, unexpected. Um, then also, uh, if you can avoid a hairdresser, do it at home in a familiar environment and if you have to go to the hairdresser, make sure it's not at the busiest time, make sure it's fairly quiet, take a weighted lap pad along and put it on your child's legs um, and if you just, you know, if it's a if it takes a long time, um, break it up and ask the hairdresser, can I just have it on my lap a little bit, give a tight cuddles, give another head massage and then continue again. Um, I think that will help. Okay, so let's see if there are more questions here. Okay, so we don't have any at this time. I think you have sent all your questions in before we have started. So thank you very much for that. And then um, just if you need any more information, you're welcome to contact us at info at Kaori Kids or at Marga at Kaori Kids. Um, I can give you lots of strategies and help through the consulting, online consulting. So you can go to Kaori Consult on one-on-one -on -one session and book a consultation session with me. The free, first one is always free. So I would love to talk to you and give you help. And then um, you can also go to the um, Kaori Kids website and just um, see what we have there and all the different programs that we have. And thank you very much for your time. It was lovely to spend this time with you.